So we're going to go straight into our next session, which is uh, a keynote from uh, somebody who Dick rather elegantly alluded to, uh, somebody who is one of the leading scientists in this whole area of agriculture, food production, and environmental protection uh, and environmental respect, really. Uh, so let me introduce you to Louise Fresco. She is the president executive uh, on the board at Wageningen University and Research. Uh, she has a whole host of different scientific accolades to her name. She's, I think, a member of at least eight different esteemed scientific academies around the world. She's also been a very senior official at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. She wrote a book with the splendid title of Hamburgers in Paradise, which obviously probably didn't sell well to vegetarians. But nonetheless, please give a very warm welcome to Louise, Fre Louise Fresco. Louise, to the lectern. Welcome. If, I, I don't know whether you want to speak at the lectern first, Louise, or? No, I'll, uh, I'll stand here. Thank you Fantastic. very much, Stephen. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. Actually, I think this is a very important moment in all of our histories. We stand, in my view, at a crossroads. We stand at a time that many things are changing around us. And the optimism that came in 1989 after the fall of the Berlin Wall, an open world, a world of harmony, actually isn't there anymore. Current geopolitical changes make that we think again in political blocks. Trade may be affected. The way we view technology is seriously affected. While demographic population growth is actually slowing down, there still are a couple of billion people who will be added to the world's population in the next few decades. And this will happen against the backdrop of strong urbanization and st strong aging of people. Put differently, it means we have an ever smaller rural population of farmers and food producers having to produce for more and more people who are more and more removed from what food production really is or what agriculture really is. That is the conundrum that we face today. Notwithstanding the success that we have had, if I take you back 100 years, more than half of the world population was suffering from malnutrition. The land was still ploughed by animals and worked by hand. What are the changes we have seen? Today, our food is more diverse. There is more food at a lower price than ever before. Food is safer than it ever was, and yet, yet, there is a profound feeling of unease about our food, about agriculture, about the way we use our land. Climate change, erosion of soil, uh, the lack of water, the quality of water, they all seem to be very close to us suddenly. The concerns that the average uh, citizen has today seems to be much greater than 50 years ago. Food has become a source of worry, not least because of some of the food scandals we've seen in recent years, not least because of the pesticides, the chemicals that are being used, not least because of the destruction of biodiversity. So that is a real, real problem. Something is happening. On the one hand, we're better off than ever before, yet to trust in science, and not just in science, in governments, in government policy, in the private sector, and even farmers, seems to be eroding. The middle classes are moving towards a way of thinking which actually rejects some of the science, not just in agriculture, but also in medicine. The opposition against something like vaccination in Europe is growing, not declining, and notwithstanding the results, so we have a major problem on our hands. And this happens at the same time when new problems are emerging, new questions are emerging. And perhaps the most important one for our sector is, of course, the question of a future agriculture in the light of climate change. And I'm not just talking about climate-resilient agriculture 
or agriculture that helps to incorporate some of the CO2. No, I'm talking about something far more fundamental. And that is that if we move, and we will move in the course of this century, towards what I would call a post-fossil world, a world in which we will continue to use some fossil fuels, but the move will be to replace fossil fuels as a source of energy and as a source of petrochemicals. In that post-fossil world, the most important resource will be biomass. And biomass, as you very well know, will be produced by agriculture and forestry, and to some extent also by marine and aquatic environments. So the challenge for agriculture, or if you want a new paradigm, is more complex than ever. Agriculture will be producing the biomass that's necessary for food, for feed, possibly to some extent for fuel, fuel, but also for all kinds of chemicals. And we will move towards a truly bio-based economy. An economy, by the way, which also needs, by its very nature, to become circular. Because we now know that the waste in all the senses of the world, where that comes from our agriculture and food production, but also from our chemical production, from our industrial production, that waste needs to be used and reused and reutilized as much as possible in something we sometimes call cascading, where we try to use, again, all the emissions, all the water, all the nutrients and enzymes that come out of the system. And as you probably know, food waste is one of the most visible items in here, but it goes much further. So, on the one hand, we have agriculture and food as a sector that meets more and more with a profound sense of unease in society. An unease that all of us feel as consumers, as farmers. At the same time, there is this enormous challenge of feeding another couple of billion people and moving up those who are not consuming enough. 11% of the world population is still really undernourished, and about 2 billion people do not have enough micronutrients, so they need to be fed. But on top of that, we have to gear ourselves towards this post-fossil post society, where biomass is going to be the most important factor. But, as you know, our success has come as a price. And that price is not just the concerns we have about biodiversity, the concerns about chemicals in the environment, the concerns about bird life, the concerns about the pollution of surface water, or the quality of our food, or the concerns we have perhaps about the nutritional composition. No, the greatest concern, the concern I feel every day, is the following. It's the lack of trust and the lack of feeling that science is able to provide solutions. It's a, a fundamental feeling, and that feeling needs to be countered. Because whatever way we turn, the future will need scientifically-based solutions. In fact, if you look at the past, then you see in the past century there have been two pillars of our success. One pillar has been a solid science-based approach, an increasing understanding of the biology of how we produce, of how actually a plant reacts to its environment, including to the pathogens that are there, of how an animal is actually reacting to feed. All that is biology, and it's the mastering of the biology in solid experimental approaches that has brought us to the current situation, where agriculture, notwithstanding what some of you may feel, is using far few ca fewer chemicals per ton of product than ever before, where our yields have gone up so much that land is actually freed up to do, again, more about landscape development and biodiversity. That's the one pillar, that solid experimental scientific approach. The other pillar, as important, and perhaps less visible even, is the continuing growing and building of partnerships. Agriculture, farmers, food producers cannot do it alone. They have to stand hand in hand, not just in producer cooperatives, but also with society at large. It's a combination of partnerships, business, NGOs, governments and farmers, and all those around there with a solid approach that has, uh, is the sole explanation of where we are today.
Yet these two things, as I said, are under threat. But there is no solution for the future of agriculture and food without looking again at what science can offer. But here's the difference. In the past, we didn't really think about some of the impacts of scientific developments. We didn't really know what the unintended side effects would be. Think of all the chemicals that were used. Nobody knew really what their effects on the long term on aquatic ecosystems would have been. There was no evidence, there was no idea, there was no way to actually get a sense of that. But today we know much more. And today we should use science in a very responsible way. And there are fantastic opportunities today. But my concern is that we are not going to use them and that we leave ourselves with unresolved questions. For example, as societies start to become more and more urbanized, with soon more than half, two-thirds of the world population in cities, it's obvious that the old uh, dichotomy between rural areas and urban areas cannot be the same. We see food production moving into cities. We see vertical farming with LED lamps coming up in cities. We see fish farms, aqua aquaponic systems, complicated systems actually in an urban environment, a kind of new position agriculture, where it's the total control of the environment that leads indeed to a very efficient resource use. But it's something completely different. Do we want that? How much of it do we want? Where are the farmers? Take example number two, robotics, drones, sensors. Very soon, every single spot on this earth will be continuously monitored. And all the data will be fed in a big data system. We will know for every square meter of the world what is happening in terms of photosynthesis, in terms of water management, nutrient management, and so on. Or take even one step further, genetics. Modern genetics, and I'm not talking genetic modification per se, but the so-called complex of new breeding techniques, CRISPR-Cas. It changes everything. It makes it possible for us to get to very detailed, precise interventions in the genome, or even to wake up, if you want, genes that are already there are not being used by plants. That's a new way of looking at things. It, it also applies to animals. It applies, in fact, to bacteria. And that opens up a new avenue of thinking. Perhaps, actually, what we need is to look at other organisms we're not using very much. Yes, some of you may think insects, possibly. I see them more as a source of feed or as digesters of some of the effluents that come out of a circular urban economy. But think of bacteria, think of algae, think of the whole potential of blue growth, of new ecosystems for food, new species. That's a different paradigm. And there are many, many more of those. But all these new steps forward that science can propose to society may be answers to questions that you're not asking. They may be unwanted answers. And to avoid that, to avoid the stalemate that we currently have on many issues, we have to tackle things differently. And that is going to be my main message to you. Because yes, we are in a stalemate. We are in a stalemate, especially here in Europe, even far more so than in Asia or in North America. We are in a stalemate where actually science gives some answers, say, for example, on GMOs, on some of the chemicals, glyphosate, for example. But politics nor society are willing to really look at those answers. And that is very much also the effect of science itself. We have been for too long in an ivory tower. So today, we have to do things differently, because the challenges are just too great. The solutions, the options that science can, be, can offer are also very great. But we need to bring these together. We need to ask ourselves, how can we build an agriculture and food system that is truly fair, that does something about inequality, that helps to bring some of the authenticity of what we feel is European farming, that helps to keep rural areas livable, but at the same time helps also to solve the problem of labor, so that not 
most of our labor will have to be taken up by guest laborers coming from elsewhere. That helps to manage some of our zoonotic diseases. That helps to manage the whole issue of biodiversity. What kind of agriculture and food system need, needs to be there? And how can we really get it truly rooted in society? So here's my proposal to you. I feel we have to learn from what the climate change community has built over the last few decades. They've worked towards an international agreement on climate. I feel the day has come today to propose to you that we should work towards an international agreement or a treaty or a convention or what have you on food and agriculture. And have that international agreement, which has to be worked out by member countries of the United Nations, but starting with Europe, obviously, have that agreement underpinned, built up by a mechanism that has been so effective in the climate change community. And just like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been the underpinning, the scientific options, the scenarios that allowed politicians and society to move forward, we need today an intergovernmental panel on food and agriculture. Not an IPCC, but an IPFA. I believe only by building scientific consensus and showing the options and the scenarios to society at large and to politicians that we can move forward. This goes much further than my previous plea here in Brussels two years ago about moving from a, a common agriculture policy to a common agriculture and food policy. This is building political consensus about the way to move forward for the world as a whole. And it should start, obviously, in Europe, with our tradition of enlightenment, with our tradition of a long and diverse agriculture, and our tradition of dialogue. There's no continent that can do that better and start this discussion now. It follows and builds upon the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and I think we should move fast. So here's my plea to the commissioners, to the commission, to all of you. Let's try and move towards an international treaty on food and agriculture to really root the options in society and in science and come to an agreement of how we move towards the future. I think we can do it, but it requires our commitment of all of us, our openness of mind and a way of thinking that may be quite different from what we're used to. We cannot take the successes of the past, however great they are, as a guarantee for the future. We have to move, and I'm quite willing, with my institution, Wageningen University and Research, to start working on building such an intergovernmental panel on food and agriculture, yeah. to provide the options and think together in a dialogue mode about where we move to and how we're going to do it, so that at the end of this century, there will be a vibrant, healthy, sustainable, and truly European agriculture and food chain that feeds everybody and has a significance for the entire world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Louise, that, that, that was a wonderful presentation, and I'm going to pick up straight away with your notion of this need for a truly international uh, focused panel, an international intergovernmental panel on the future of food and agriculture, as you say, akin to what we've seen uh, in climate change and the climate change debate. I'm going to wave my magic wand and make you the leader, the chairperson of this new intergovernmental panel. We're going to imagine it's already up and running. We're going to imagine that it's given draconian powers to, to initiate new policy around the world. What do you think, if you were the leader of this panel and you had those powers, what would you pick as your priorities today, looking to uh, develop an agriculture fit for the year 2050 and the years 2100 and beyond? Let me make one um, proviso here. The intergovernmental panel itself, uh, the, the scientific basis should only provide options and scenarios. It's the political world that should make the choices. So for example, um, it's, 
it's the politicians who have to say, uh, what if we move towards an agriculture with a minimal use of chemicals? What does it mean? What does it mean to yields? What does it mean to the industry? What does it mean to farmers? Those are the kinds of op options that the panel, the intergovernmental panels should do. But your question is really about what are the political choices? Where are the politicians yes, well, coming okay. in? Okay, what, what yeah? options would you prioritize and say to the politicians, in my opinion, with all the body of research and, and knowledge behind me, in my opinion, this is what you should be prioritizing now. Well, what governments definitely need to be doing is to make sure that we have a, a healthy agriculture. Uh, producing healthy food. And that means that we have to optimize the use of all things that could be detrimental to society and to the environment. So, very simply put, if people, farmers or whoever, use chemicals, then the polluter pays is a first principle. We need fiscal measures to make sure that we uh, have no fraud in food. We need to talk about what is the best mix for a country of small and large farmers? Um, where and, and by the way, I don't know if you were able to listen yes, to our yes, panel yes, earlier, yes, yeah. but the message from there was really understand the potential that lies in small and exactly. in local and family exactly. and community-based yeah. uh, initiatives. Yeah. Do you think we've got the balance wrong right now? We've, we've gone over the top in our embrace of large scale? No, I think there is definitely in, in Europe room for small-scale farming. However, if you have the number of cities with more than 10 million people, you cannot have small-scale farming feed them all. You can also not just go to a uh, country-based agriculture. Most of our countries in Europe have been importing food for centuries. So the question is to how to strike a balance. It seems to me that a small uh, and medium enterprises in agriculture have to be located there where we want to maintain the landscape and the biodiversity. That's where these approaches work very well. But if it comes to feeding, uh, for example, these very large cities, then obviously some of the options are indeed in a more automated or high-tech environment because labor is going to be one of our major constraints. So it's the, the, it's the mix that you need to discuss and the mix will not be the same for every country. Right. On the, you know, your presentation was interesting because at the heart of it was a message uh, which in a sense was something of a mea culpa because you were saying, you know, we in, in, in the sort of academic and science field who work in and around food production, agriculture and environmental concerns haven't succeeded in taking the public with us in, in a lot of the new technologies. And I suppose one could particularly think about GMOs and the whole debate about yeah. that, where, where science and public opinion seem very far apart. How do you change that? Because one of your messages is that through the course of the 21st century, we must change that. We must mm -hmm. find a way of reconnecting the public with science and faith in science in this field of food production. So how do you do it? Well, absolutely. But it's not just science. It's also uh, the industry. If you take GMO, I'm utterly convinced that it was a historical mistake to start large-scale GMO, genetically modified organisms, um, in large-scale agriculture, mechanized agriculture, and aimed at herbicide resistance. That was all the wrong things. If we had started with wheat, which was, uh, you know, genetically changed in order to incorporate genes from broccoli, which would protect against stomach cancer, the story would have been different. And so the question is, is very much, what are this, the applications for which we would accept for example, genetic modification. The, the, the issue plays out very, very dominantly now, and I really want to draw all your attention to that, with the new breeding techniques, this CRISPR-Cas, which do not necessarily lead to genetically modified organisms, but use some of the techniques. This is where we should ask ourselves on a case-by-case -case basis, without generalizing what works and why we want to use it. We're not doing that. We, we, we still go too much in a sort of blanket pro and contra. This is definitely also the mistake of, 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 of science in the past, but it's also the, uh, the very heavily um, dominated debate on the internet where, you know, 
um, it looks sometimes as if science is just an opinion. Science is, of course, still the only system we have that has a sort of self-cleansing system where most, like in, in climate change, most of the scientists agree on a certain number of issues. Yes, this may change and we may correct it, but it's this correcting mechanism that we should show, and we have not done that sufficiently. Okay, I'm going to open it up to questions from the floor. I've got a, a few um, uh, social media questions up for Louise as well, but uh, hands up, anybody who's got a question for Lu Louise right now, I'll try and make sure I can see at the back. So, uh, you, sir, we are keen to get microphones to all parts of the room. So, yes, you, sir, with the jacket, and, and there you go, you're standing up. We'll get the microphone to you, then we'll come down to the front. But, yeah, you, sir, first. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Koen van Keer. I'm from Yara a Mineral Fert... I cannot see you. Oh, there. Okay. Yes. I'm from Yara Mineral Fertilizer Company. I was very intrigued by your view on the post-fossil world and, and the importance of biomass. And, and I share that view. I, I think biomass will become more important, also maybe even as a building material. But I have one question there. Are we not ultimately then also going to run into the same planetary boundaries uh, which we are facing now? Because biomass, ultimately, to grow that, you need land, you need soil, you need water, you need nutrients, you need labor people, so that's my question. Is there a risk if we're really going to depend very much on, on using more biomass than what we use today, that we will also run into limitations and boundaries? Mm. Thank you. Um, I think that's a, a, a very valid question. I, uh, I'm actually quite optimistic about this in the sense that um, biomass is fueled, as you know, by solar energy, which is the only source we have which is truly sustainable and will last another couple of billion years on this planet. So um, biomass in itself is, it can be grown in, in many parts of the world, but more importantly, we will move towards a far more circular economy where we will reuse a lot of the biomass and, and retrieve, for example, all the essential nutrients. Biomass is important to us for two reasons. One is fibers, including fibers that we can use for construction and so on, and of course for nutrients. And by re reusing both the fibers and the nutrients in a truly circular economy, we will probably be far more efficient than we have been so far. Plus, where we can grow biomass is a much vaster area than where we can grow crops because we, we don't need to be so worried about areas that are limited by uh, temperature or rainfall. So I think this will work out even better, um, also because, of course, in the longer term, I'm talking 2200, which may seem very far for some of you, but for a scientist, that's around the corner. Um, the population, world population, of course, is declining. So our needs in the longer term are going to be much less and much better met by a circular economy. Really? I, I, tell them, talk me through that then. So we're going to get to 9 billion people on our no, planet. 10, perhaps even. Yes. OK, and then we start declining, do we? Uh, yes, so we do. But we don't. The decline uh, is already happening in, in Europe from 2065 onwards. It will be um, much slower in Africa. That's the only continent where uh, population growth will continue for quite a while, which means that at the end of this uh, century, um, there will be four billion people in Africa. So, right. our, but Africa... So the, the peak, overall peak is around 10 billion. Yeah, nine and a half, ten. It depends a little bit. We've made, made mistakes. I mean, I remember not so long ago, we still thought about 12 billion. That yeah. seems to be out of the question. And you must remember that the, the, the highest percentage growth in terms of additional people every year is not now. People sometimes easily speak about exponential growth now. That's not at all the case. The highest growth was in the 1980s. Mm. So we're way past that. And if you look at Asia, you see the, the decline there too. Uh, Japan, Korea, and even China are but, declining. But interesting, and you know, this may be something we can tease out uh, in question and answer, but, but the, 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 the huge demand for, for more food is going to be in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, can I add one thing? The, the one key issue here is not just the, the calorie needs of people, of course, but the protein needs. Mm. And finding new solutions for protein, including alternatives to animal protein, is going to be our major scientific challenge. 
might come back to that too. Uh, quick one from Twitter and then so you, but I just want to get this one out of the way because um, it, it's important. And then I'll come to you, I promise. From Johnny Wake, who's a farmer in the UK. Johnny, salutations to you. Your question is, okay, we've heard that you'd love this international inter intergovernmental panel on the future of uh, food and agriculture, but is it just pie in the sky? And if not, which bodies are going to make an in, you know, a panel happen and then an international treaty? Uh, who's going to make it happen, is his question. Well, the United Nations. I mean, the United Nations have the Sustainable Development Goals. Most of those Sustainable Development Goals actually feed directly into food and agriculture. Uh, you will see that. Um, there is overall agreement. All member countries have subscribed to the Sustainable Development Goals. And it seems to be a logical step that the United Nations now say, OK, in order to move forward food and agriculture, which are so essential to our future, um, we must get a concerted effort and take those parts of these SDGs together, get the General Assembly to entertain the idea of working towards a treaty. Tr trouble is, a cynic would say in the era of Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, the idea of, of these sort of multilateral, meaningful uh, initiatives to change the world uh, is, is becoming more fanciful, not less so. Yes, but on the other hand, we all, everybody, not least Mr. Putin, ha has an enormous problem on food and agriculture. Uh, it's not something you can leave alone. And arguing uh, about the ineffectivity of the United Nations is not going to move that forward. So, um, you know, as you know, I spent 10 years... I think years that answer defines you as an optimist. I think that's fair. <laughs> yes, I'm absolutely yeah. <laughs> an optimist, and I do think that there is no better body than the UN. However, well. as I said, let's start in Europe. Let's show that it can work. And you first need to political will, and we'll, we should, you should ask Phil Hogan what he thinks about yeah. that, and Franz Timmermans for that oh, matter. Oh, I will, don't you worry. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we have to get this moving, so today is the day. And then <laughs> you can get your scientific panel. Maybe you should do the questioning, not me. Yes, I, 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 might, I, might be rather more effective. It, yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, stick around then. Um, you, sir, you've been very patient. Okay. Uh, Pierre Lacomte, Foundation for the Urban Environment. Your talk was very inspiring. Uh, and you spoke at some point about agreement, at some point about treaty. As you know, the trouble with the climate conventions, including the most successful one uh, of Paris, is that there is no constraint. There is no treaty. How will you solve that problem? Notwithstanding the IPCC excellent work, which is now becoming a little more uh, fluid, uh, there is still no obligations to stick to the convention. And so, therefore, the amount of greenhouse gases is continuing to increase very quickly instead of diminishing. Yes. And so, my question is how do you apply this unfortunate negative uh, uh, experience of the climate to the new organization you wish to bring in? And I fully agree with you that would be very necessary. Well, again, there I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic. I, let's not go into the intricacies of a difference between a treaty, convention, etc. What we need is political will. And even with climate, what really makes a difference today is public opinion and the responsiveness of the private sector. So, yes, there are no uh, real... Um, constraints or penalties or fines whatsoever. But you see the private sector moving very fast towards alternative energy, towards electrical mobility. You see cities, and don't underestimate the importance of cities in this, you see cities moving towards uh, goals defined as CO2-free city in 2030 or 2050. So I think here, Political will will follow public opinion. Now, for food and agriculture, of course, it's a more complex issue, but the public opinion is very much all geared towards having healthy food that doesn't, uh, doesn't damage the environment, feed the world sustainably without um, damaging the planet. And I think that is something that everybody feels here. I'm sure if we take a poll, that's what you feel as well. I guess the difference is, you know, this parallel you keep making between climate change and, and the future of uh, food production and, and uh, agriculture, the difference is that every single person can immediately relate to food as an issue in their lives because they go to the supermarket and they have to buy the stuff every Right, so it makes it even year. better, easier. Well, it, it, 
better and worse. You could argue, yes, it makes it much more relevant and easy for them to understand, but right. surely the, the, the flip side of that is that what they care about more than anything else, or, uh, frankly, is price, you know, affordability. Yes. And, and that may skew the argument in a way that doesn't help no. you achieve some of your other ends. Because I think the, the, the default option in supermarkets in the near future has to be that there cannot be anything in the supermarket which is not sustainably produced and which is not fairly produced and has a fair price. And again, in order to do that, you need a treaty or you need an agreement because otherwise there will not be a level playing field in among the different partners in the business community or farmers. So that, uh, that is something we have to work through. And that is where the European Union, of course, can take some measures to make sure that, we, that the consumer is not brought into more confusion today, not knowing whether he or she should buy organic or biological or imported or not imported or local and how local is local and is local better. No, just have some standards, which then that's why you need your intergovernmental panel, some standards that we all agree on. Mm. And so you have nothing in a supermarket that is either treated, you know, or produced with say, animal that, you, unfriendly... You do make it sound magnificently sort of simple. And no, I, it's I, not. I, I mean, you know, I've had enough <laughs> years behind my, my back to know how difficult <laughs> it is. But if we don't have these grand visions, and if, again, if the European Union, with its commitment to enlightenment, doesn't start this, then it will not happen. And I'm very convinced with my contacts with NGOs and the business community that there is the will to do something. And everybody feels strongly about food, more so than ever. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Uh, we've got time for at least one more. Uh, yes, sir. You've got the microphone. Go on. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Um, I'm Peter Spanok from Ghent University. I'm teaching to students, agricultural students, and that's also my question. Because I see that's really the bottleneck of today. How can you motivate, attract young people to do agricultural studies? Because you're also from university, so I want to hear your vision on that. Yes, I love that question. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, 15 to 20 years ago at Wageningen, we had very few students. Today, we're growing faster than ever with students from all over the world. How many do you have? About 12,000 right now. And all specialized, so we only have applied life sciences, food and agriculture, and it's booming. That's all you do? Yes, we do nothing else. Wow. Um, <laughs> which is quite, as you know, is quite enough. Um, <laughs> And why, why are students coming? Because exactly because of this issue, they feel very strongly about the importance of food. They feel strongly about biodiversity, about climate change, about responsible ways of using land and water. And by providing them with a scientific basis, they also feel they have something to offer. So we have students from all over the world. We have more than 110 nationalities of people who all want to study just that. So I am very convinced that that is the right approach. However, it should start much more early. It should start in primary school and in secondary school. I find it amazing that you learn history or ge geography, but you don't learn about the importance of this nexus of food, water, energy, health. That should be part and parcel of every child's education. And that's where we should start. Great. Um... I think it's fair to say people like that answer, yeah. Uh, okay. Right, L last one, because then we've got another panel to do. So, uh, who wants the lucky ticket to ask the last question? A lady. A lady, yeah, I quite don't right. want any more uh, men asking Good. Ma'am, you've responded to the challenge. Uh, we'll get the microphone to you. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name's Lynn Forte. I work for the Canadian government at the Canadian Mission here in Brussels. Uh, and I don't, I'm, you might not like this as the last question, but I, I'm just wondering, you're talking about this international panel. Of, um, how would that be different than work that's already going on at the FAO, at Codex, all the existing international discussions on agriculture? Well, just as we had the climate change panel next to UNEP, 
fed by the different specialized agencies of the UN, this will be sitting next to FEO, and FEO could even have the secretariat if it comes to a, a UN effort. So I don't see that as a contradiction. FEO, uh, just like many of the UN agencies, don't have the body of science that would be required for an intergovernmental body on food and agriculture. And also, this would have a greater political sort of yeah, import sure, momentum sure. behind so, it. So, right. so that, to me, is a logical corollary that we would involve the UN agencies, especially if we go the route through the SDGs. However, I'm not naive, so I still want the European Union not to get out of this task and really start seriously doing it here in Europe first. And well, we, if Louise, we can show this, then it will work. That's a very neat segue into our next uh, panel, which does involve um, some rather important players. I know, in, I know exactly. you know, so I'm <laughs> thanking you I for a very elegant uh, link and segue to our next panel. But before I do that, my main aim is to thank you so much for a terrific yeah, contribution. Thank Louise, thank, thank you very you. much thank indeed. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much.